Part 3 tells why the necessary action and interaction of the conscious and subconscious minds require two corresponding systems of nerves. It explains how the connection is made between these two systems of nerves. It explains and tells of a central point in the body for the distribution of energy, how this energy is distributed, how the distribution of this energy gives the individual pleasant sensations, how the interruption of this distribution brings discord, disharmony, lack and limitation of every kind. It tells of an arch enemy which must be destroyed and tells how to destroy it. It tells what determines the experiences in life with which we are to meet and why these experiences are under our own control. One enthusiastic reader says of this part, this document, in my opinion, is the greatest single document beneficial to mankind ever written in the history of the world. It is the first time that I have come into a true understanding of the silent powers that dominate and determine one's success. You have found that the individual may act on the universal and that the result of this action and interaction is cause and effect. Thought, therefore, is the cause, and the experiences with which you meet in life are the effect. Eliminate, therefore, any possible tendency to complain of conditions as they have been or as they are because it rests with you to change them and make them what you would like them to be. Direct your efforts to a realization of the mental resources always at your command from which all real and lasting power comes. Persist in this practice till you come into a realization of the fact that there can be no failure in the accomplishment of any proper object in life if you but understand your power and persist in your object because the mind forces are ever ready to lend themselves to a purposeful will in the effort to crystallize thought and desire into actions, events, and conditions. Whereas in the beginning each function of life and each action is the result of conscious thought, the habitual actions become automatic, and the thought that controls them passes into the realm of the subconscious. Yet it is just as intelligent as before. It is necessary that it becomes automatic or subconscious in order that the self-conscious mind may attend to other things. The new actions will, however, in their turn, become habitual, then automatic, then subconscious in order that the mind may again be freed from this detail and advance to still other activities. When you realize this, you will have found a source of power which will enable you to cope with any situation in life which may develop. The necessary interaction of the conscious and subconscious mind requires a similar interaction between the corresponding systems of nerves. Judge Truard indicates the very beautiful method by which this interaction is effected. He says, the cerebrospinal system is the organ of the conscious mind, and the sympathetic is the organ of the subconscious. The cerebrospinal is the channel through which we receive conscious perception from the physical senses and exercise control over the movements of the body. This system of nerves has its center in the brain. The sympathetic system has its center in a ganglionic mass at the back of the stomach known as the solar plexus, and it is the channel of that mental action which unconsciously supports the vital functions of the body. The connection between the two systems is made by the vagus nerve, which passes out of the cerebral region as a portion of the voluntary system to the thorax, sending out branches to the heart and lungs, and finally passing through the diaphragm, loses its outer coating and becomes identified with the nerves of the sympathetic system so forming a connecting link between the two and making man physically a single entity. We have seen that every thought is perceived by the brain, which is the organ of the conscious. It is here subjected to our power of reasoning. When the objective mind has been satisfied that the thought is true, it is sent to the solar plexus, or the brain of the subjective mind, to be made into our flesh, to be brought into the world as a reality. It is then no longer susceptible to any argument whatever. The subconscious mind cannot argue, it only acts. It accepts the conclusions of the objective mind as final. The solar plexus has been likened to the sun of the body because it is a central point of distribution for the energy which the body is constantly generating. This energy is very real energy, and this sun is a very real sun.
and the energy is being distributed by very real nerves to all parts of the body and is thrown off in an atmosphere which envelops the body. If this radiation is sufficiently strong, the person is called magnetic. He is said to be filled with personal magnetism. Such a person may wield an immense power for good. His presence alone will often bring comfort to the troubled minds with which he comes in contact. When the solar plexus is in active operation and is radiating life, energy, and vitality to every part of the body and to everyone whom he meets, the sensations are pleasant, the body is filled with health, and all with whom he comes in contact experience a pleasant sensation. If there is any interruption of this radiation, the sensations are unpleasant, the flow of life and energy to some part of the body is stopped, and this is the cause of every ill to the human race, physical, mental, or environmental. Physical, because the sun of the body is no longer generating sufficient energy to vitalize some part of the body. Mental, because the conscious mind is dependent upon the subconscious mind for the vitality necessary to support its thought. And environmental, because the connection between the subconscious mind and the universal mind is being interrupted. The solar plexus is the point at which the part meets with the whole, where the finite becomes infinite, where the uncreate becomes create, the universal becomes individualized, the invisible becomes visible. It is the point at which life appears and there is no limit to the amount of life an individual may generate from this solar center. This center of energy is omnipotent because it is the point of contact with all life and all intelligence. It can, therefore, accomplish whatever it is directed to accomplish. And herein lies the power of the conscious mind. The subconscious can and will carry out such plans and ideas as may be suggested to it by the conscious mind. Conscious thought, then, is master of this sun center from which the life and energy of the entire body flow. And the quality of the thought which we entertain determines the quality of the thought which this sun will radiate. And the character of the thought which our conscious mind entertains will determine the character of the thought which this sun will radiate. And the nature of the thought which our conscious mind entertains will determine the nature of thought which this sun will radiate. And consequently will determine the nature of the experience which will result. It is evident, therefore, that all we have to do is let our light shine. The more energy we can radiate, the more rapidly shall we be enabled to transmute undesirable conditions into sources of pleasure and profit. The important question, then, is how to let this light shine, how to generate this energy. Non-resistant thought expands the solar plexus. Resistant thought contracts it. Pleasant thought expands it. Unpleasant thought contracts it. Thoughts of courage, power, confidence, and hope all produce a corresponding state. But the one arch enemy of the solar plexus, which must be absolutely destroyed before there is any possibility of letting any light shine, is fear. This enemy must be completely destroyed. He must be eliminated. He must be expelled forever. He is the cloud which hides the sun, which causes a perpetual gloom. It is this personal devil which makes men fear the past, the present, and the future, fear themselves, their friends, and their enemies, fear everything and everybody. When fear is effectually and completely destroyed, your light will shine, the clouds will disperse, and you will have found the source of power, energy, and life. When you find that you are really one with the infinite power and when you can consciously realize this power by a practical demonstration of your ability to overcome any adverse condition by the power of your thought, you will have nothing to fear. Fear will have been destroyed and you will have come into possession of your birthright. It is our attitude of mind towards life which determines the experiences with which we are to meet. If we expect nothing, we shall have nothing. If we demand much, we shall receive the greater portion. The world is harsh only as we fail to assert ourselves. 
The criticism of the world is bitter only to those who cannot compel room for their ideas. It is fear of this criticism that causes many ideas to fail to see the light of day. But the man who knows that he has a solar plexus will not fear criticism or anything else. He will be too busy radiating courage, confidence, and power. He will anticipate success by his mental attitude. He will pound barriers to pieces and leap over the chasm of doubt and hesitation which fear places in his path. A knowledge of our ability consciously to radiate health, strength, and harmony will bring us into a realization that there is nothing to fear because we are in touch with infinite strength. This knowledge can be gained only by making a practical application of this information. We learn by doing. Through practice, the athlete becomes powerful. As the following statement is of considerable importance, I will put it in several ways so that you cannot fail to get the full significance of it. If you are religiously inclined, I would say you can let your light shine. If your mind has a bias towards physical science, I would say you can wake the solar plexus. Or if you prefer the strictly scientific interpretation, I will say that you can impress your subconscious mind. I have already told you what the result of this impression will be. It is the method in which you are now interested. You have already learned that the subconscious is intelligent and that it is creative and responsive to the will of the conscious mind. What then is the most natural way of making the desired impression? Mentally concentrate on the object of your desire. When you are concentrating, you are impressing the subconscious. This is not the only way, but it is a simple and effective way, and the most direct way, and consequently the way in which the best results are secured. It is the method which is producing such extraordinary results that many think that miracles are being accomplished. It is the method by which every great inventor, every great financier, every great statesman has been enabled to convert the subtle and invisible forces of desire, faith, and confidence into actual, tangible, concrete facts in the objective world. The subconscious mind is a part of the universal mind. The universal is the creative principle of the universe. A part must be the same in kind and quality as the whole. This means that this creative power is absolutely unlimited. It is not bound by precedent of any kind and consequently has no prior existing pattern by which to apply its constructive principle. We have found that the subconscious mind is responsive to our conscious will, which means that the unlimited creative power of the universal mind is within the control of the conscious mind of the individual. When making a practical application of this principle, in accordance with the exercises given in subsequent parts, it is well to remember that it is not necessary to outline the method by which the subconscious will produce the results you desire. The finite cannot inform the infinite. You are simply to say what you desire, not how you are to obtain it. You are the channel by which the undifferentiated is being differentiated. And this differentiation is being accomplished by appropriation. It only requires recognition to set causes in motion which will bring about results in accordance with your desire. And this is accomplished because the universal can act only through the individual. And the individual can act only through the universal. They are one. For your next exercise, I will ask you to go one step further. I want you not only to be perfectly still and inhibit all thought as far as possible, but relax, let go, let the muscles take their normal condition. This will remove all pressure from the nerves and eliminate that tension which so frequently produces physical exhaustion. Physical relaxation is a voluntary exercise of the will, and the exercise will be found to be of great value as it enables the blood to circulate freely to and from the brain and body. Tension leads to mental unrest and abnormal mental activity of the mind. It produces worry, care, fear, and anxiety. Relaxation is therefore an absolute necessity in order to allow the mental faculties to exercise the greatest freedom. Make this exercise as thorough and complete as possible. Mentally determine that you will relax 
every muscle and nerve until you feel quiet and restful and at peace with yourself and the world. The solar plexus will then be ready to function and you will be surprised at the result. In the words of Emerson, we judge of a man's wisdom by his hope, knowing that the perception of the inexhaustibleness of nature is an immortal youth.